أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا والنبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والعن أعداءهم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to accept your fast, <coughs> to accept your a'mal, and to make us from those who benefit from Shahr Ramadan, and to make us from those who follow on the footsteps of Ahl al-Bayt salam, especially Imam al-Hasan salam, these days being the days of Imam al-Hasan salam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do all of this um, by the right of a salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. These being the days of Imam al Hassan salam, <clears throat> and the last two days that were that we we were together, we discussed some aspects of Imam al Hassan salam's life, in which we spoke about the value of Imam al Hassan salam and what makes Imam al Hassan salam the perfect leader. We said we said that some sociologists came forward and said that human beings in the state of nomadism they see that the leader is the one who holds strength. After they've gone that stage and they've advanced a little bit more, they start to find leadership in the one who has more knowledge. And then when knowledge becomes widespread, they start to find leadership in the one who has morals and values, someone that has a value system and someone who's ethical, someone that just does not lead through the iron fist rather makes decisions in accordance to what is ethical first and foremost and then secondly what is best for his himself and his people or herself and her people regardless we said imam al hassan salam exemplified the good morals and the values and that's why he was loved so much by his people and the people that he stood up in front of accepted him these values were instilled in Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam obviously because he is the Imam. He is the value system in itself. But also, also what gave the people, uh, what gave Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam rather, value in the eyes of the people were the words that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said was what Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam exemplified where he was known to be Kareem Ahl al-Bayt where just by being from Ahl al-Bayt is an honor enough, but to be the one who is the generous, the generous of them is, is an honor like no honor. And it is something that obviously, obviously is going to be widespread and known if there is that much, that much distinction for Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. We said this amongst many, many other qualities. One of them, one of them that really, really, really shows itself and is always accompanied with Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam is how Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam sacrificed everything that he had, the power that he had for the Muslimin and made peace with Muawiyah where you can say the sacrifice of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam by making peace with Muawiyah you can arguably say it's harder than the sacrifice of death or life where if you are to fight someone in battle, it's either you win or they win. Even if you know you're on the losing side and you die, death is so much easier, so much easier than to make peace with the likes of Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, than to feel in one way or another humiliated by making peace with such an individual and ultimately giving him the khilafah. That's aside from the fact that the likes of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam would be ridiculed for, for generations to come for that decision, would be called weak, billah, would be called a coward, billah, would be called someone who has no decision-making skills and no leadership skills and looked down upon for generations to come for that decision. And so you found that Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam made that sacrifice and in our terms, the way we would say it, although Imam Hassan has no arrogance, but if the way we understand it as low human beings, we would say he put his arrogance aside. He had to put his, he had to put that selfishness in, in essence aside, although the Imam did not have it, but the way we understand it is he had to put that aside for the people, for Islam as a whole. 
for Islam as a whole. And so he himself, alayhi salam, had to humble himself in front of Islam for Islam itself. And Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam, Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam, takes honor in humbling himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his religion. And so the decision making by of Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam, in the decision that he made was not one that made or brought about um, dishonor to Imam al Hassan. Rather, rather, it was what gave value in the eyes of the Muslimin to come later on that truly understood the treaty of Imam al-Hasan. It gave value to Imam al-Hasan in the eyes of the people that truly understood the decision that was made. And it really did give him honor. Why? Why? Because ultimately Muawiyah was exposed and the work of Imam al-Hasan was finished and completed. And the ultimate goal that he had was completed. Today, my brothers and sisters, we want to discuss this treaty. We want to discuss what happened from the very beginning, not just the treaty itself, but what led to the treaty, what led to the treaty, how everything fell apart and how everything was seemingly perfect for Imam al-Hasan, perfect for Imam al-Hasan. And some may argue that the situation of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam in the beginning, when he took over the reins of Khilafah from his father, were better, were better. Then this was better with his, than the situation of Imam Ali alayhi salam when he took the Khilafah. With the situation of Imam al-Hasan was more promising, you can argue, than the situation of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam when he first took the Khilafah. We want to know how this perfect situation ended up turning against Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. And how this perfect situation today ended up, ended up, and Imam al Hassan having to surrender the caliphate, the government to who? The likes of Muawiyah. What happened? How was it day and then it turned into night in an instant? How did that happen? We want to discuss, inshallah ta'ala. Before we begin, my brothers and sisters, let's have a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad for Imam al Hassan alayhi salam and also it being Mother's Day. Let's have a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad for all of the mothers that are out there. And inshallah ta'ala, this lecture, all of the ajr from this lecture is going, going to go to all of our mothers. ta'ala. Let's have that intention. And I think, I think that is the best present that you can possibly get your mother on this day. Get her flowers. Because if you tell her I just gave you the lecture that I listened to or the rewards from the lecture, she may or may not be happy. So I advise you get her flowers. But also this lecture, inshallah, is for my mother and the mothers of the mu'mineen and mu'minat on this day. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Jamil, Imam Ali alayhi salam was killed in Kufa. In the three or so days that Imam Ali alayhi salam was alive after he was struck in Kufa, he sat with Imam al Hassan. He was with Imam al Hassan. He gives Imam al Hassan the famous will. And ultimately appoints Imam al Hassan as the Khalifa, the Imam after him. Amir al Mu'mineen passes away. Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein alayhi salamullah bury Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Najaf. They return back to Kuf. Here, the historians differ, or there's two opinions. Some historians are of the opinion that Imam al Hassan salam, declared his imamate or declared his caliphate. He was the imam from birth, but declared his caliphate two days after the death of Amir al Mu'mineen. But the majority of scholars, the majority of historians say no. The night after, rather, the same night, Amir, Imam Hassan salam, declared his caliphate to the Muslimin. It is said he stood up in front of the Muslimin and he said, Whoever knows me, knows me. Whoever doesn't know me, then let them know. I am Al-Hasan ibn Ali. I am Al-Hasan, son of Ali. And as we said yesterday, he begins to list his merits, who he is, who his forefathers were, who his father was, his relationship to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why he is the Khalifa and why he is the rightful person for this place. And so you found the Muslimin began to reciprocate with Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam that support and they began to pledge their allegiance. 
some of them began to narrate a hadith, narrate a hadith to the people that were there about the merit of Imam al Hassan, as we said two nights ago. A man from the tribe of Yazd, he stands up and he says, I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put you on his lap and say, for example, he say that I love you and whoever loves you, Ya Hassan, whoever loves my son, Allah loves them. For example, some of the hadith come forward and, and, and speak in the stone. Other hadith, for example, say that let those that are present tell those that are absent. That whoever loves Al Hassan ultimately loves Allah, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves them. This man from Yazd, he narrates such a hadith, and other people also narrate such a hadith. And so the people know that the man standing in front of them is not a normal man. And as you know, my brothers and sisters, many of those that were present were not present at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many of them were born after the death of Rasulullah. And so these ahadith strengthened their tie and their love and their allegiance to Imam al-Hasan Seemingly, seemingly, there was a consensus almost to Imam al-Hasan When you go to history and you read the numbers and you read the different villages or the different cities, the different areas that pledged their allegiance to Imam al-Hasan, and then you compare it with Sham, Syria, you say Muawiyah doesn't stand a chance. For example, in Kufa, 42,000 people pledged allegiance to Imam al-Hasan Basra, Mada, and other parts of Iraq, almost all of, the, all of the Iraqi cities and all of the areas of Iraq, pretty much all of Iraq, pledged allegiance to Imam al-Hasan Iran, the people of Persia, pledged allegiance to Imam al-Hasan through Zayd ibn Abi. Through Zayd ibn Abi, they had a proxy allegiance as, in essence. They had someone that represented them and he was Zayd ibn Abi. And this person on behalf of the Persians, pledged allegiance to Imam al-Hasan. Similarly, Yemen and Hajaz pledged allegiance to Imam al-Hasan through Jariah ibn Qudama. So you have everyone, everyone pledging their allegiance left, right and center to Imam al-Hasan Comparing Imam al Hassan alayhi salam's influence to the influence of Muawiyah, there was nothing left for Muawiyah. Nothing left for Muawiyah. And this allegiance, my brothers and sisters, in the beginning, in the beginning was strong. As in, they didn't just pledge allegiance because, well, everyone was doing it. Some of them, obviously. But the overwhelming tone or aura that you found, the tone itself was that of real allegiance. Ibn Kathir, he comes forward and says that they loved him more than his father. The people that were there, they loved Imam al-Hasan more than his father, more than Amir al-Mu'mineen. And their swords and hearts were with him. They say the swords and the hearts were with him. When it came to Abu Abdullah al-Hussein salam on the plains of Karbala, what did they say? It is said, their swords are against you, but their hearts are with you. Imam al-Hasan had both. He had the swords and the hearts. So again, making that comparison, you see that Muawiyah has nothing against Imam al-Hasan And Imam al-Hasan is not going to have any problems with Muawiyah. And so that's exactly what happened. Imam al-Hasan took charge. He began employing people in the government of the Mu'mineen. He started to put people in places of governance. He started to appoint governors. He started to work within the system to try and better the system and get it going, jumpstart it once again. Because as you know, when a leader dies, everything stops. Yes? Imam al-Hassan started to jumpstart the system once again. Who hears of this? Muawiyah. Muawiyah hears of this. And right when he hears of this, he takes heed to it. Why? It was just a few years back. Just a few years back. Who was he fighting? When he was fighting Amir al-Mu'mini, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he was inches, you would say, inches from falling off the cliff and losing everything. Metaphorically falling off the cliff. He was, he was moments away from being destroyed by Malik al-Ashtar. Yani Imam, Imam Ali alayhi salam in the battle of Safin was moments away from destroying Muawiyah and his entire army and, and erasing Muawiyah from history. And as you know, as you know, what stopped Amir al-Mu'mineen was not the reluctance of Imam Ali. Rather, it was 
his own people turning against him. Imam Ali's army turning against him and calling for al-muhakama, calling for negotiations. But if it was to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Muawiyah would have been gone. And so when Muawiyah heard that Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam took over the reins of Khilafah, he acted promptly. He said, I'm not going to have this happen again. He acted promptly. What did he do? It is said he gathered, he gathered his people, the prominent um, individuals of Bani Umayyah, the prominent family members of Bani Umayyah. He had them come to a meeting. And so they discussed, to discuss rather, what is the best method? What is the best option in this circumstance? What do we do? They came together and after much debate, they came up with two things. A strategy that implores two steps for them to take over Imam al-Hasan. They know if they are to fight Imam al-Hasan, the sheer numbers would erase them off the map. And not just this, the allegiance of the people to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, the outward allegiance was too much to bear. When it came to numbers, Muawiyah had nothing. When it came to numbers and allegiance, Muawiyah didn't have anything against Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. Especially if Imam al-Hasan was to call on all of the different cities that pledged allegiance to him. So Muawiyah knew he had nothing in terms of an army to face Imam al-Hasan in battle. And so he had to devise a plan to destroy Imam al-Hasan's army without fighting him. Muawiyah was cunning. Muawiyah was cunning, was sly. So what was the two-step plan? Number one. Send spies, send spies to gather information. And if they can kill Imam al-Hassan right then and there, let them do it. Let them do it. Let them carry out assassinations on the leaders of Imam al-Hassan's army, at the leaders of Imam al-Hassan's movement, and even Imam al-Hassan himself. From the beginning, no negotiations, no battle, no war. Send the spies. If they can get to Imam al-Hassan, let them kill him. That's it. No more, no less. That's the first step. The second step, if it persists, if the spies are not successful, if Imam al-Hasan finds a way, finds a way to keep himself safe and keep his leaders safe and keep his movement going to evade assassination, then the second step was to start bribing the leaders of Imam al-Hasan's army. To offer them money and wealth like no other. And we're not talking a few dirhams here and there, guys. No. No, no, no. We're talking in the thousands, even in the millions. Millions. So that was a two-step plan. Send assassins. If they can't get the job done, then let money get the job done. Jamil. The assassins were sent. It is said after the assassins were sent, some time passes. Muawiyah gets news. What does he get news? His assassins, his spies were caught and they were killed. Some of them were killed. If not, all of them were killed. And Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam writes to Muawiyah. He writes to Muawiyah. What does he say to him? He says this. He says, you sent men to deceive and carry out assassinations. And you sent spies if you want to meet in battle as if that, sorry. And you sent spies as if you want to meet in battle. And that is something that will come soon, so wait for it. After that, there was back and forth between Imam al-Hasan and Muawiyah, in which Muawiyah threatens, openly threatens Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. Openly threatens Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam Allah. When Imam al-Hasan finds there's no negotiating with the likes of Muawiyah, there's no discussion with the likes of Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam calls his people to war. He calls his people to war. Khalas. Khalas. Jami. When he calls his people to war, he sends his companions out to get the tribes in and around Medina, in and around Kufa, to get the Arabian tribes together so that they can aid and support Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. Here, the ulama come forward and say, the army that was gathered for Imam al-Hasan comprised of four groups. And they also split them into five groups. The first group was the Shia. Those that had allegiance to Imam al-Hasan. 
physically and also in their aqaid, in their beliefs. Like that was one group. The second group were those that were blindly following their tribe leaders. Their allegiance to Imam al Hassan alayhi salam had no value, had no fruit, had no spiritual identity to it, more or less. It was blindly following the leaders themselves. It was merely cultural, traditional. And those people were easy to buy out, by the way. The third ones were the Khawarij. The Khawarij, who are the Khawarij? We know them. Those who fought Amir al Mu'minin in Nahrawan. Jamil. Those who fought Amir al Mu'minin in Nahrawan, why did they stand up to Amir al Mu'minin? Because they were of the belief that no one was to be the governor, the Khalifa, the emperor, the king of the Muslimin. Imam was, had, had no legitimacy. And Allah himself was the Hakim. Essentially, these people believed that Muawiyah was not to be in place of power. Ali was not to be in a place of power. And anyone, anyone that was under their reign was a target. Was a target. Jameel. Imam al Hassan salam, takes over. Taib, why were they with Imam al Hassan if they don't if they believe that no one should be the Khalifa? Taib, they got rid of Amir al Mu'minin Ali bin Abi Talib through the likes of Abdul Rahman ibn Mujam, who was a Khariji. Taib, Muawiyah was still there. And by the way, those who don't know, the night that Amir al Mu'minin was assassinated, he was not he wasn't the only target. There was actually two, three other two other people other than Amir al Mu'minin that was the target. Amir al Mu'minin was a target and he was killed. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan was also a target. He was also a target, and he was actually injured. He was injured. So in the same way that Amir al-Mu'mineen was going to be killed, Muawiyah was also targeted in the same way, and he was injured. The man missed. He had really bad aim, apparently. And, and Muawiyah was injured. He was not killed. And also a third one as well, a governor for Muawiyah, I believe it was, was also targeted. And that governor sent someone else on that night instead of him and that man was killed instead. So essentially, essentially, that assassination, the Imam Ali alayhi salam's assassination was not just the assassin assassination of Imam Ali alayhi salam. It was assassination of a group of people. And by assassinating this group of people, the Khawarij were going to get what they wanted. Tayyip, Muawiyah's assassination failed. And they want anything to get at Muawiyah. So who are they going to side with? To them, to them, it's the lesser of two evils. Either we side with Muawiyah or we side with Al Hassan, who's ultimately going to go and kill Muawiyah. And we have animosity towards Muawiyah, so we're going to be with Al Hassan. Do they have allegiance to Imam Al Hassan? No. Their allegiance itself is probably dwindling. Why? Because this is the son of the man we just assassinated. Like you, the Khawarij. And then there are those that were there just to get the money. They knew that after war, people would die. And they're going to have swords and shields and money in their pockets and jewelry. They were after that. They were after the loot. Some scholars come and say that there's the fifth group. Those that were doubters. Thou, those that were not from the Shias or from the Shias but were doubters. Those that were on the fence with everyone, essentially. The layman's. The layman's person. The doubter. The one that had an incentive to be there. But his incentive was not strong enough essentially. So this was what the army of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam comprised of. Who jumped on that? Muawiyah. Muawiyah. The Shias are not going to be bought out. The likes of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, the likes of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam Allah, those are not going to be bought out. Jameel. The Khawarij, maybe you can buy them out. Maybe you can buy them out. So I put them aside if they were if we were to say that they had the incentive of hate animosity so you put them aside maybe maybe they were not going to be bought out but they were the minority many of them died in Nahrawan anyway so they were the minority Jamil those that follow their tribe leaders those are easily bought out and those that were following Lutma they're there for the money give them money and tell them not to fight they're like yeah no problem absolutely no problem they'll take the money any day and so Muawiyah began to buy out the leaders of Imam Hassan's army. Some scholars, although there's a difference of opinion here or there's some discussion about this, some scholars even say that Ubaidullah ibn Abbas was bought out. 
And you find this in the book of also Sheikh Bakr Sharif al Qarashi. He openly says it in other books as well. Sulh al Hasan, Ghayru. Ubaidullah ibn Abbas, who was essentially the cousin of Imam al Hasan alayhi salam, was bought up. Who was he? Who was he? He was the leader of the army or a big faction of the army. He had command over no less than 8,000 soldiers of Imam al Hasan. He was offered by Muawiyah one million dinar or dirham. He was offered by Imam al Hasan by Muawiyah Afwan one million coins. And so it is said he slipped away in the night after Imam al Hasan alayhi salam started to move. He slipped away in the night and took with him eight thousand men. And who was this? The cousin of. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Now, on this, there could be difference of opinion. On this, there could be debate as to what actually happened. Now, that's for the ulama alayhim, radhwanullah. But I'm more or less narrating what you found in the books. Just to keep this idea and exaggerate the idea, make it clear, make it clear that Imam al Hassan was betrayed by the leaders of his army, by those that were closest to him, even after Ubaidullah left the new. Army commander also betrayed Imam al Hassan, and Imam al Hassan said he will betray me. So you found that Imam al Hassan alayhi salam's army was shaky. Imam al Hassan moves. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam moves until he gets to a place called Jisr al Munbij or Jisr al Manbij. This bridge, my brothers and sisters, was a strategic place. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam puts up his camp there. After Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam puts up his camp, Sheikh al-Mufid in Kitab al-Irshad, he says, Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam wanted to test his people. He wanted to test their loyalty. And so he stands up in front of them and he says these words. Listen to the words of the Imam alayhi salam. He says, he stands up, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sends his blessing to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, I am the sincerest of, of Allah's creatures and giving advice to them. I have not become one who bears malice to any Muslim, nor one who wishes evil or misfortune over them or for others. Indeed, what you, dis what you dislike in unity is better for you than what you like in division. I see what is better for you than you yourselves. Therefore, don't oppose me in any of my commands and don't reject my judgment. That's all he said. Did he say he was going to make peace? No. Did he say he was going to submit to Muawiyah? No. All he's telling them is, right now, right now, I need to know that you are loyal to me. I need to know that if I command you to do anything, you will do as I say. Because my sincerity, my integrity, my values, my values speak for themselves. And they direct me to making the best possible decision to benefit all of the Muslimin, those who are against me and those that are with me. This is how Ahlul Bayt think. Those that are standing in front of me, how can I get them to me as the Imam? And those that are with me, how can I keep them? Any other political figure would have said, kill them, kill their fathers, kill their mothers, kill their leader. That's it. I don't want any of this anymore. Imam um, Hassan alayhi salam is looking for all of the Muslims. And he said his words, all of the Muslims. I have no malice to any Muslim. This is the ultimate goal of Imam um, Hassan alayhi salam. After he said those words, the people started lo looking left and right. What is he saying? What is he trying to tell us? He starts to say he's trying to make peace. He's not trying to fight Muawiyah. The people that were following money, so if, though, if they were bought out, they were not there. If they were still there, they still wanted money. The Khawarij wanted anything to get to Muawiyah. So they wanted Imam al Hassan to fight. Those that were following their tribe leaders, if the tribe leader said, No, I want to fight Muawiyah, he was one of those that wanted money. The Tayyib, those, those that were with him were going to accept fight, a fight, and support their leaders. And so the people naturally, naturally, some of them wanted to fight. And so when they felt that Imam al Hassan alayhi salam was alluding to a potential agreement of some sort, although that's not what Imam al-Hasan said at all, they turned against him. They turned against him. 
The Wayat say they attacked him. They called him a kafir. They called him a disbeliever. They looted Imam al Hassan's tent. That some of them took the cloak off of Imam al Hassan alayhi shoulders. Others took the the prayer mat of Imam al Hassan. They looted Imam al Hassan's camp. Imam al Hassan alayhi gets between the crowd. He gets up on one of his horses and he begins to get escorted through the crowd. He summons the tribes of Rabi'ah and Hamdan to come and support him and help him and protect him. As they were protecting him, as Imam al Hassan السلام, was making his way, a man by the name of Jarrah ibn Sinan gets through the people. He gets to Imam al Hassan and stabs Imam al Hassan in the leg. As he's going to attack Imam al Hassan, السلام, when he's going to attack him, he's screaming, Ya Hassan, you've become a kafir just like your father before you. Prove it. That those that were with Imam al Hassan, many of them were khawat. Many of them, many of them had no allegiance to Al-Hassan, no allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib, no allegiance to anyone. They were there for alternative motives. As he's stabbing Imam Al-Hassan, he says, you've become a kafir like your father before you. He stabs Imam Al-Hassan Imam Al-Hassan is taking to one of the houses of the companions and now Imam Al-Hassan has to make a choice. His men are bought out. His greatest leaders were bought out and took with them thousands of soldiers, according to some riwayat. His men turned against him. His men not only turned against him, they could have abandoned him, but they attacked him. He was looted. No humiliation comes close to Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. But he has no supporters. He has no one with him. The Shias that were there, but they were the minority as well. They were the minority. And Allah, maybe even some of the Shias were bought out. If Ubaidullah ibn Abbas was bought out, like what, what stops some of the Shias from being bought out? Yani? Imam al Hassan salam, comes forward and thinks, he says, I can trek on and risk losing it all, or I can expose Muawiyah. Because back then, by the way, by my brothers and sisters, Muawiyah was not seen as the evil being he was. Yani. Muawiyah was not seen for who he truly was. Muawiyah was seen as one of the companions because he lived at the time of the Rasulullah. He was called Khal al Mu'minin, the uncle of the Mu'minin, because his sister married Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And therefore, he was the uncle of the Mu'minin if his sister was the mother of the Mu'minin. He was given such a title. He was seen as a pious individual. When he fought Imam Ali alayhi salam in Safin, he was seen to have some sort of reason and he was justified to some degree. It wasn't just about the caliphate, nor was it just about power to him, apparently. This was what was propagated. This was what was told to the people. And so the people did not know Muawiyah. They didn't know who he was. Imam Hassan salam he says to himself, either I go and I fight Muawiyah, and I take a chance of losing everything, and the numbers don't serve me, or I fight this Aqaidiyan. I fight this through Aqaid. I win the battle of Aqaid, even if I don't win the battle on the ground. I win the ideological battle. And so Imam al Hassan alayhi salam calls for a peace treaty. What does Muawiyah do? Muawiyah makes the ultimate mistake. He takes a paper. And he writes on top of it, this is what Al Hassan ibn Ali and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan have agreed upon. And he signs the paper blank. He sends the blank paper to Imam Al Hassan. And essentially, Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam has the ability to write down any condition that he wanted. The biggest mistake of the sly, the cunning Muawiyah. Because now, Imam al Hassan can write anything. And he has a signature of Muawiyah on the paper. Khalas, he can write anything. And so Imam al Hassan begins to write. Number one, if you pass away Muawiyah, the caliphate comes to me, al Hassan ibn Ali, or my brother Hussein ibn Ali. It is not to go to anyone that you appoint. Number two, the Shias are to live in peace within your government. They are not to be hurt. They are not to be killed. They are not to be persecuted. Number two. 
Number three, Al Hassan alayhi salam also is to be protected and safe. Number, three. Number four, you are to follow the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, number five, number six, number seven. Many different conditions were put down. Jamie, the peace treaty was done. It was announced. Everyone knew of the treaty. Muawiyah becomes the Khalifa of the Muslimin. And Al Hassan alayhi salam is sidelined. Little did they know that Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam was sitting watching his plan unfold. Because he knew Muawiyah was not going to be, he's not going to be loyal to the conditions. He knew that Muawiyah was there for just power. And when the person who's striving for just power, when they get power, they become mutamarrid. They become the pharaoh of their time. And the persona that they used to show in pursuit of that power is ultimately going to fade away because they have the power now. So their true colors are going to be shown. And that's exactly what happened with Muawiyah. The first sermon, or one of the first sermons that Muawiyah gives, he comes in front of the people and he says, the treaty between me and Al-Hasan is under my feet. I did not fight you to have, I did not fight you to have you pray, nor did I fight you for you to pay zakat, nor did I fight you for you to abide by the rules. I fought you to have power over you. Outwardly says it. He outwardly says it. Khalas, he has what he wants. After the death of Imam al-Hasan, Muawiyah appoints Yazid. The Shias were persecuted by, were persecuted by Muawiyah. Imam Ali's name, alayhi salam, was belittled and sworn at on the pulpits for decades. Al-Hasan ibn Ali was killed by Muawiyah. None of the conditions, not one of them. And history, my brothers and sisters, history is, will bear witness from now until Day of Judgment. That Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan broke the peace treaty with Imam al Hassan by not only not by not abiding by the conditions, but by starting war again, by killing, by persecuting the Shias, by killing Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, by doing his utmost to make the life of Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam Allah miserable. And Imam al Hassan is the one that exposed that and ultimately paved the way. For Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to stand on the day of Ashura and call for what is rightfully his. And that is the Khilafah given to him by Muawiyah. Not that he needs to take it from the likes of Muawiyah. But legally speaking, it was given to him by Muawiyah. It wasn't given to him by anyone else. Legally speaking, Muawiyah signed off on the Caliphate of Imam al Hussein. Legally speaking. Imam al Hussein was the rightful Khalifa in the words of Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. And some will say, Tayyib, some will say, Tayyib, he is the Khalifa, Tayyib, he can change his mind and give it to Yazid. I'll tell you, that's true. If he didn't write, if he didn't sign a contract that was with someone else, an agreement with someone else, if it was merely his decision, if it was one sided, then yes, he could change his mind, legally speaking, change his mind. But when you sign a contract with someone else, you're legally bound by that contract. So it gave legitimacy to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, even from a legal perspective. Even from a non Muslim's perspective, they can see the legitimacy of Imam al Hussein's revolution. From, from many different angles, many different aspects, Imam al Hassan's treaty made it clear who was on the truth and who was on the path of falsehood and put a hujja on everyone that was there and for people to come who the truth was with and who is the embodiment of falsehood who is the embodiment of falsehood this is what imam al hasan alayhi salam did and this is the sacrifice of imam al hasan alayhi salam that we wish to learn from أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم أسأله تعالى يعفو عنا ويغفر لنا ويرحمنا إنه نعم المولى ونعم النصير وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين